All right, this will be the beginning of Creation Science 102, our second class. In the first uh, 10 week course, we talked about the age of the Earth and the Big Bang Theory and things that are in my seminar, parts 1 and 2A. And we left off in the middle of uh, talking about the cavemen. Uh, we left off talking about Jack Cuazzo and his tremendous book, Buried Alive, which is just about the Neanderthal men. Uh, Jack Cuazzo is a dentist. He studied all of them, went and saw the actual bones instead of the reproductions, or what most people see is just a casting. And he has pictures in here showing how that they've been constructed uh, uh, wrong, and they're just normal humans who have diseases like rickets and arthritis and acromegaly and things like that. By the way, in case you don't know, the Neander Thal, Neanderthal, the H is silent, Neanderthal man is named after the Neander Valley, which was named after Jochan or Joachim Neander, who was a German Christian who used to wander through that valley, and he composed a song that's in our songbook. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. He's the one who wrote that song, and Neander Valley is named after him. And, of course, Satan likes to counterfeit or undo all the good that the Lord does, so now we have Neanderthal man named after the same valley because that's where it was found. The first one was found in 1856. Shortly thereafter, Charles Darwin's book came out, and evolution became a popular theory. When the Neanderthal man was first found, it was classified by the experts who studied it as a human who probably drowned in the flood. They said he had received several blows to the head because there were some bumps on his head where he had hit and been hit pretty hard and healed, and he had several diseases. I think he said he suffered from rickets in old age and some other disease, or rickets in childhood and uh, arthritis in old age. That was the analysis of the skeleton, and that analysis is still valid today, but because they don't have any other missing links, they've decided to use an Anderthal man as a missing link when it's not at all. It's just 100% human. Recently, there was a study done that said the Neanderthal DNA is 3 or 4% different than average human DNA. I'm not sure exactly what they studied about the DNA, but that's now the big thing in the news that Neanderthal man is not even part of the human lineage. When actually, the variation from normal human DNA is 5 or 6 or 7% either way. This guy's 3 or 4% off of the average, so he's within the range of human anyway. Now, how they can say, you know, he's not human, I don't know, but... Yeah, I'd recommend you get Coazzo's book if you want to study more on the Neanderthals. It's Neanderthals. It's just really a tremendous book, well written. When he first began doing research on this in France, uh, his life was threatened because this is big business. These uh, missing links are big business for the people who make money off of them. You know, they've got these museums displaying these uh, fossils, and people pay money to come see this. And he was saying, "Hey, it's just a normal human." And so his life was threatened. They uh, chased his car. Uh, he had to outrun somebody who was chasing his car trying to kill him. It tells the whole uh, drama in here of what happened in the uh, Neanderthals. Okay, let's talk about uh, Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. Donald Johansson found Lucy uh, in 1974 in the Hadar Valley. Donald Johansson uh, was a nobody. Nobody had ever heard of him, and now he's a famous scientist because he found this Lucy creature. He admitted in this book, uh, Bones of Contention, that he had received a grant of, I think, $47,000 to go look for missing links. So for him to say he found a missing link is like getting someone, uh, a mother, to write a rec job recommendation for their own son. You know, it's a little bit of a slanted uh, opinion. Of course, he had to find something. He was about to run out of grant money when somebody... Uh, found him, found, brought him some bones, and they went and dug him up and discovered Lucy. There's an awful lot of controversy about Lucy, and I want to share with you to, uh, in this section just a little bit about Lucy. Hadar Valley is in Ethiopia. You can see it on the map right there. This is part of the Great Rift Valley. There's a crack all the way across this part of Africa, sort of like the Grand Canyon, only it's, uh, it's obviously a fault line like the San Andreas Fault, called the Great Rift Valley. And many uh, so-called missing links come from this area in uh, Ethiopia and down into Kenya. So this is a common place for them to go look for fossils or so-called missing links. Lucy, when Donald Johnson found Lucy, he found 40% of the skeleton. Here it is right here. While they were digging out these bones, they were listening to a song that was very famous at the time, a rock and roll song by the Beatles called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which has the initials LSD on purpose. The Beatles were very big into drugs. We can go off on a long tangent there if we'd like. 
one of the Beatles' uh, uh, songs, as they're singing whatever the main song was, in the background, you can hear, if you change the speaker over to the left or right speaker, whichever it is, you hear some people chanting through the entire song, smoke pot, smoke pot, smoke pot, through the whole song, as a subliminal effect to get into the conscious of kids in the early 70s. On one of the Beatles' record albums, on the cover of the album, they're all standing there with their suits and ties and smiling for the picture. All around them is marijuana plants. Not a lot of people caught that, of course, you know, but well, it's marijuana plants everywhere. It looks like, looks like, you know, shrubbery around them or something, but it's all marijuana plants. They were very big into drugs. Anyway, Johansson was listening to the song as they dug it out, so they decided to name this skeleton Lucy. There is an awful lot of controversy about this. There are some who think and have some pretty good evidence that the hip bone actually came from a young African girl. It wasn't even part of this skeleton. It was brought later. You have to understand how these guys find their fossils. They will go to Africa and they will hire the local natives to go look for bones. And they will pay them if they find, if they're successful and bring them some good fossil skeletons. Well. In a country where the people are starving to death and any amount of money is great, you know, there's a real strong indication that they're likely to bring in anything, you know, and try to make you buy, try to get you to buy it, you know, as a missing link. So, Donald Johansson found 40% of the skeleton. This is considered the most complete uh, Australopithecine ever found. So, one of the quiz questions will be, what is the, the most famous Australopithecine? This is supposed to be part of the missing links for you know, A-U-S-T-R, let's see, Australo, hmm, we better look that one up. Like Austra Australia, comes from the root word Australia. And then the last part is afarensis, A-F-E-R-E-N-S-I-S -E -E for Africa, afarensis. The whole thing is explained in how they name them, et cetera, in this book, Bones of Contention, which is $13 through our ministry, or you can buy it for $13.50 through other places if you'd like, but it's really a very good book, and it's got a section on each of the so-called cavemen. But Lucy, there's Australopithecus there, A-U-S-T-R-A-L-O-P-I-T-H-E-C-U-S, Australopithecus, just to the right of the circle on the left. They have Australopithecus robustus and Australopithecus afarensis. Robustus means it's bigger and stronger, more robust, where that gets the name. Um, Al Johansson claimed that he found this creature, Lucy, and he found 40% of the skeleton over a relatively small area. I think he said 70 square meters is the way he described it. If I'm not mistaken on that, I don't know. But I named it Lucy because of the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. In National Geographic in 1985, an article appeared about Lucy. They pointed to this knee joint, the bottom part of the upper thigh bone and the upper part of the lower leg bone, the knee joint, and said this was Lucy's knee. Now actually, this particular knee joint was found a year later, I'm sorry, a year earlier. It was found a mile and a half away and 200 feet or 70 meters deeper in a totally different layer of strata. This knee, knee joint National Geographic labeled it Lucy's Knee five times. They called it Lucy's Knee. Now, Donald Johansson, when he speaks on the topic, is very careful not to call it Lucy's Knee because it's obviously not. You know, it's found a mile and a half away. But Tom Willis uh, of the Creation Ministry in uh, Kansas City area has a great article about Lucy's Knee Joint, and we'll get you some copies of this. Lucy remains at college. You can get a hold of Tom Willis and get all sorts of details on what really happened with uh, Lucy's knee. Tom Willis went to hear Donald Johansson speak, and he, Donald Johansson was at, take, at taking questions at the end. So there were no questions with 800 people there, so Tom volunteered to ask him a few questions. You know, was that really Lucy's knee? You know, and why did you allow National Geographic to call it this five times when it wasn't Lucy's knee? You're allowing this, uh, this fraud to be perpetuated when it's really not. But the reason they like this one to be part of Australopithecine is because the bones are slightly bigger than an ape. On the far right, you'll see the, the bones of an ape, which are straight in a straight line. The lower leg and the upper leg line up. On a human, your thigh bone is angled because your hips are wider than your knees in your normal stance because we walk upright.
whereas an ape that walks on all fours or bent over, they have a different bone structure in their leg. And so your thigh bone is angled coming off of the knee joint. Um, this one that they called Lucy's knee, actually the Hadar knee, was also angled. He said this proves it's becoming a human. Tom Willis's number is right there, 816-618-3610. Uh, if you want to get hold of Tom Willis, he's got plenty of material on Lucy. And uh, it really gives them fits over this because they just, they're simply lying uh, to try to claim all this is a missing link. But they're so desperate for evidence for their evolution theory that any evidence is good enough. You know, we'll take it. We'll use it. Um, he said, because the femur was angled, that proves it is becoming a human and learning to walk upright. See, one of the millions of changes that would have to happen between an ape and a human is it have to go from walking on four legs, mostly. Apes, chimpanzees can walk on two sometimes, but it's uncomfortable for them because of the way their hip is built and their back is built. They're more comfortable walking on four. Plus, their fingers and toes curl under. They're called knuckle walkers. If you watch a chimpanzee walking, you know, they walk on their knuckles like this. They don't walk flat on the bottom of their feet or hands like, like we would. They have their toes curled under. Um, the femur was angled on this one they found a mile and a half away that they, some claimed was Lucy's when it really wasn't. The truth of the matter is any monkey that climbs trees has angled femurs. It's called ab, abhoral, abhoral, how do you pronounce that, Jan? You're the English, you know, tree dwelling. Abhoral, living in trees. Tree-dwelling tree, tree monkeys have angled femurs. So it's not proof it's becoming a human. It could be just a tree-climbing monkey that he found the bones of. Secondly, his claim was Lucy's knee was slightly bigger than a regular ape. Well, that doesn't prove a thing, of course, you know. The bones of a Clydesdale are slightly bigger than a regular horse. That does not prove it is becoming a truck. It's just a heavy-duty chimpanzee, that's all. And if the Bible is correct, before the flood came, the world was very different. People were living longer and probably growing bigger. And it makes sense that probably everything was bigger and stronger before the world was destroyed by that flood in the days of Noah. So Lucy is not a missing link at all. The St. Louis Zoo has a display up, a wax figure of Lucy. Now you gotta understand Lucy is three feet six inches tall. So when you go to the zoo, and I've been there many times, every time I go to St. Louis, I go there just to keep my blood boiling uh, because, because of all the lies in that crazy place, trying to push evolution. For instance, when you walk in to this one section of the zoo, they've got a uh, um, Charles Darwin sitting behind a desk in his little office, and he's, it's a mechanical thing, and he stands up and begins talking to you about evolution. And the whole zoo seems to be devoted to pushing this one theory of evolution. Why on earth does a zoo have to talk about evolution? Why, don't you can't, why can't you go look at the animals, you know? But they think they have to use the zoo to teach the boys and girls who come about evolution, and that's what they're doing at many zoos across, across the country. But actually, for Lucy, not one foot bone or hand bone was found. None. But on St. Louis Zoo's wax figure, they put human feet and human hands. No bones at all were actually found. Other australopithecines that have been found all had curled toes. They were obviously knuckle walkers. And their big toe was separated from their other toes, indicating it's called a grasping foot, where they can actually grab a tree branch with their foot. You can't do that because your toes all line up, and you know, your big toe and other toes line up. But all the other australopithecines had this grasping foot with a toe separation. But the St. Louis Zoo put Lucy with human feet on there. There's no telling how many hundreds of thousands of kids go through this thing and see this every year and are impressed with the idea, wow, they have evidence for evolution. And it's just pure propaganda. That's not evidence for evolution. A professor from Washington University said, the statue is a complete misrepresentation. And I believe they know it is a misrepresentation. That is a fancy word that means a lie. The zoo director of education, Bruce Carr, said, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. I don't know if there's a pun intended there or not, but <laughs> certainly would be one. He said, we cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. Now, excuse me, Bruce, what impression are you trying to get across to these kids? Are you trying to make them believe there's evidence that apes turn to humans or ape-like creatures turn to humans? Is that what you're trying to make the kids believe? Well, if you really have some evidence for evolution, I would like to see it.
I'm not against evidence. I'm against lying. And this is lying. That's not evidence for evolution. The uh, Laetoli footprints that were found were perfectly normal human footprints. All of the articles that came out about this time, they found footprints in the ash that had hardened, the ash from a volcano. Somebody had walked across it and left footprints, and it hardened, sort of like concrete would do. Well, these footprints were in rock supposed to be 3.75 million years old. Now, this creates a problem since those folks who believe in evolution have been teaching man did not evolve until probably about one to two million years ago. And here we have ash that they have dated at 3.75 million years old. We will get into later on video or on seminar part seven of how they do the dating of these ash layers. And it's absolutely ridiculous uh, how they date this with potassium argon dating and the wild numbers they get. But see, the theory supersedes all the evidence in their mind. There's a great chapter in the end of this book called The Dating Game, showing how the dates can be changed whenever the need arises. You know, to make, uh, if a potassium argon or carbon date doesn't fit the theory, well, you simply change it, you know. They can date it again as many times as necessary to get the number they were looking for to begin with, which is not science, and I don't understand how they can't see that. But they said, uh, they said this, this proves hominids were walking upright 3.75 million years ago. Because here you have normal human footprints. Now, they measure numerous things about the footprint. The width compared to the length. This, what's called the straddle, how far apart are the right footprints and the left footprints, the toe out, you know, uh, caster and camber like you do on a car, you know, the stride. By measuring everything about these footprints, they say they're perfectly normal, exactly like ours. But yet they said this proves hominids. Now, why would they call it a hominid? Why didn't they say humans? Why don't they say this proves humans were here 3.75 million years ago? Now, the truth is that layer of ash is not 3.75 million years old. That's all baloney. We'll get into that later. But even if they're right, by their own thinking, they should say, wait a minute, we found normal human footprints. This would be made by a normal human. Um, maybe that proves man's always been man. But they don't seem to consider that possibility. They said the form of his foot was exactly the same as ours. This is from National Geographic talking about these footprints. It says weight-bearing pressure patterns in the prints resemble human ones. Footprints so very much like our own. Russell Tuttle, University of Chicago, did the most extensive study of the Laetoli footprints, as well as studying the footprints of more than 70 habitually unshod people, people who go all their life with no shoes. He found the 3.5 million year old footprint trails at Laetoli Site G resemble those of habitually unshod modern humans. None of their features suggest that the Laetoli hominids were less capable bipeds than we are. What he's saying is, you compare these footprints with people who traditionally go without shoes, they look the same. He said, if the G footprints were not known to be so old, we could readily conclude they were made by a member of our own genus, Homo. Now, do you understand how the evolution prejudice destroys their normal thinking process. If you walked along the beach and found some human footprints along the beach, you would conclude that a human just walked there in the sand, obviously, right? Here they find normal human footprints in the ash, but because they've already decided this layer is too old, therefore, we know it can't be human, but all the evidence says it was. But see, it goes against the preconceived idea. And this is an example, one of millions of examples that can be given of how evolution theory is protected against any evidence that might go against it. You would think a rational, logical thinking person would say, you know, maybe we should throw out the theory. Normally in science, you get a theory, you, do, you gather evidence. If your evidence contradicts your theory, you throw the theory away and you get a new theory. That's the way it happens in all branches of science except paleontology when it comes to defending the theory of evolution. National Geographic drew a picture of dark-skinned, ape-like people on top of these footprints. Now understand, all they found were footprints. How would you know the color of their skin? One well, evolutionist got all upset with me and said, well, that's because this is Africa. They're dark-skinned over there. Well, maybe so. But maybe this is a, um, a slight uh, racial slam trying to uh, imply that dark-skinned people are less evolved. Hitler certainly believed that. 
Hitler thought the blacks were inferior to the Aryans, you know, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians and Germans. And we'll get into more of that much later on seminar part five of my series on how Hitler's philosophy and racism tie together in evolution. But also, the artist for this picture for National Geographic in 1979 drew the footprints with a toe separation, trying to imply it is starting to become a grasping foot. See, your footprint, you couldn't grasp a tree branch and hang upside down with your big toe on one side and your other toes on the other side. Monkeys can, of course. And they drew this picture by making the toe a little further over than was actually found, making a little separation. This is called propaganda in my book. I think they should report the facts, and if it contradicts your theory, well then, for heaven's sake, throw away the theory and get a new one. The problem is, many people like that evolution theory because it gives them freedom from God. And I'm convinced, after studying this topic for 30-some years, that's the reason they keep that evolution theory. Charles Oxnard studied every one of the Lucy bones. He measured every angle or every dimension of the bones and compared them. It's called a multivariate analysis. He spent, I believe, 16 years studying Lucy. He said, folks, the various Australopithecines, which is Lucy, are indeed more different from both African apes and humans in most features than these latter are from each other. In other words, Lucy is more different from humans and apes than apes are from humans. It's not a missing link at all. It's just an unusual monkey, that's all. So if anybody tells you Lucy is a missing link, you need to tell them they're misinformed. Or they're lying. I don't know of a nicer way to say it, but that's just the way it goes, okay? There could be some Lucy-type monkeys, a monkey that traditionally or commonly walks on two legs and consequently has a slightly different hip structure, there could be some still alive. It's just a monkey is all it is. I mean, several birds, uh, most birds walk on two legs, you know, have an upright posture. Uh, the fact that if it walks on two legs does not prove it is starting to become a human. It proves God made a species of monkeys that walks on two legs part of the time, or most of the time even. But uh, that Creation Magazine is excellent. Uh, magazine back in 96, they had a good article about you know, is Lucy still alive? Down in Sumatra, which is down near Vietnam area, Indonesia. Um, experts will tell you there is really no evidence of how man evolved. By the time you get done reading this book, Bones of Contention by Marvin Lubinow, now, what Lubinow does in here, he spent 25 years studying all of the so-called missing links. Has a section on each one in here. He says at the beginning of the book, he says, I'm going to assume that their dating, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go by their dates that they give to these missing links, okay? If they say it's 1.6 million years old, okay, we're going to believe them. He said, I don't believe any of that stuff, but we're going to go by their teaching. And so just by their own teaching, he shows that the, the dates are totally wrong. They overlap each other. You have the children existing before the grandparents. You know, the, by the way that they say they evolved, it just doesn't work. Uh, so it really is, is an interesting expose on that topic. I recommend uh, you read that one for all the lowdown on the so-called missing links. Um, the only missing link I've been able to find is modern man. He's definitely got something missing between his ears. He thinks we came from an ape-like ancestor. He spends all his spare time digging in the dirt looking for bones. My dog does the same thing. But we don't make the taxpayers pay his salary while he does it. would <laughs> be the major uh, difference. But they seem to be so desperate to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, just like Romans chapter 1 says. These folks really don't like the idea of God creating the world. The Bible says they profess themselves to be wise, but they're fools. It's a, it's a shame. And they are not the enemy. Those who believe in evolution are not the enemy. We need to love them and pray for them and witness to them, and they can be saved like anybody else. They're blinded by the devil. I'm convinced of that. I was in a debate uh, several months ago, and this uh, professor was up there saying, folks, we've got proof for evolution. We found this fossil. You know, I don't, it wasn't Lucy. It was another one. We found this fossil, and this proves man came from an ape-like ancestor. When it was my turn, I got up, and I said, folks, I'd like to point out the obvious. If this was a court of law, and this guy came in and says, judge, we have evidence that apes turned to humans, and here's the fossil we found in the dirt. I would say, your honor, it's pretty obvious. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know that it had any kids, do you? You find a skeleton in the dirt. 
You don't know that it had any kids. You certainly don't know that it had different kids. And why do they think the bones in the dirt can do something the animals today cannot do? Every kind of animal in the world produces after its kind. Humans have humans. Apes have apes. Chimpanzees have chimpanzees. If they think an ape-like creature could produce a human in the past, well, why don't they have an ape-like creature produce a human again? Only let's study it this time. I mean, I want to see it happen. <laughs> it only happens long ago and far away, which is fairy tale material. Evolution doesn't happen. No animal has ever produced anything other than its kind. Now, you don't want to use the word species when you get into discussions with them. Just stick with the word kind and you'll be safe. Okay, we'll take a little break and when we come back, we'll talk about where does the Stone Age fit into the Bible? What about the Stone Age coming up next? Where does the Stone Age fit into the Bible? Was there a time when civilizations existed with mostly stone tools as opposed to iron or copper or brass or bronze or some of the things we use today? Well, I would point out there are people today who use stone tools. There are what we would call Stone Age civilizations all over the world because that's all that's available to them. I think if there was a general Stone Age for the whole world, it would have been right after the flood because the flood destroyed everything. When the people got off of that ark, they opened the door and walked out, and there's nothing. Everything had been ruined. I mean, you figure they stayed in the ark about six months after they hit bottom. How tall would the trees be by the time they walked out the door? You know, this tall, maybe? Seeds floating around do just fine. You know, I float around in water for a few months and then germinate, but... Uh, probably the extra six months. I mean, you can plant just about any vegetable and get it up to eatable size in a few months. You know, I don't know what garden lengths are. I know up north it's a little faster because they have longer days than they do down here. So they're, though they have shorter growing season because the days are longer, they end up getting their fruit in or getting their crops in earlier. But, uh, so in six months, you'd have plenty to eat outside for the animals. So that's probably why they stayed in six more months. There's simply no reason to go outside. Nothing out there to eat. But, uh, they got off the ark and faced just a ruined world. And so you don't tell your grandson, our fax said, to go to the hardware store and get you a shovel. There aren't any hardware stores. There aren't any shovels. There's nothing. There is no civilization. Gone. It's like going and landing on the moon. So, you know, it's going to take a while to figure out where the iron ore deposits are. You know, where the gold deposits are and silver deposits and copper deposits. You've got to find this stuff, the ore in the ground. Meanwhile, you're going to get hungry. And it takes a while to dig out iron ore, melt it down, and, you know, make iron tools out of it or steel tools. It just, it takes a while to do that. So, meanwhile, you've got to have supper. So it makes common sense that you're going to go make some stone tools, which are much quicker, take some hard rock, chip it sharp, you know, and make stone arrowheads or whatever. So probably uh, <clears throat> they faced what I would call a Gilligan's Island situation. Maybe other people under other parts of the world have not seen the video or the movie about Gilligan's Island. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen that where they're on a ship, you know, and the, the storm blows them off course and they land on an island and they end up, this crew of eight or nine people have to live there for years and years and years until the show becomes unpopular <laughs> and they take it off the air. But uh, there's just, there's nothing to work with. So you have to use stone or bamboo or whatever you can find to make your house, to make your tools, to uh, mortar and pestle. Everything has to be done out of stone. And plus, if you're a nomad society traveling around from area to area, you got to carry everything with you. So now you don't want to have, you know, a bunch of stuff to haul around with you if it's heavy because you, whatever you got, you got to carry it. So they would tend to minimize their tools. Now, the Aborigines in Australia, even today, uh, some of them are nomadic. They wander around. So they don't carry any tools. So they use their teeth as a vice. And, you know, if you're going to strip the bark off a tree branch, you clamp it down in your teeth while you hold it. Well, that tightens up the masseter muscles. You're always using your teeth. That's your favorite tool. That's your pliers. That's everything, you know. And so the masseter muscle gets bigger just from use so much, you know, like a bodybuilder. And any bodybuilder will tell you the more you use a muscle, the more it pulls on the bone, and pretty soon the body responds by building more bone mass there. So the bones actually get bigger. So aborigines typically have bigger jaws and a different shaped face than ours. 
And it's nothing to do with evolution. That's a bodybuilder. They're using their jaws more. That's all it is. And somehow they get this idea that a hundred years ago, people were shooting the Aborigines, killing them like cows, thinking they're just, you know, a missing link and they're, you know, they haven't evolved as far and it really would be better for the world if we wiped them out. In 1904, at the St. Louis Zoo, where the zoo is today, they had a World's Fair there. 1904 is held in St. Louis. Um, they had a dis display. A section of the zoo was set up with all pygmies, with their pygmy uh, huts and you know fires and families living there as an evolution display to show they hadn't evolved as far. One fella, uh, Ota Benga, his name is, was taken away from his wife and two kids and put in a cage with chimpanzees as evidence for evolution. The guy's a little pygmy, about four foot five or something like that. He went insane and killed himself. We'll cover a lot more on that in uh, seminar part five about the philosophy of evolution and what happens. But before the flood, things are doing great, you know, even though the world had been cursed. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us when the curse was, you know, when Adam sinned. I suspect they probably lived in the garden for a hundred years. Just for sake of argument, let's assume the only facts we have to go on as far as when Adam and Eve sinned and were kicked out of the garden. Here's the only facts we have. Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Before that, they had two kids, Cain and Abel, but no dates are given. They were out of the garden before any kids were born. So they could have easily been in the garden for a hundred years before they sinned. I think some people tend to read the Bible and say, wow, you know, God made them and they sin immediately. I just, I can't, can't buy that, okay? Could have been a hundred years later that they disobeyed God and then the ground is cursed. What we have from the curse is just a few clues in the Bible. Thorns and thistles are going to come up. It's going to be pain and childbearing. And it's about all you're going to get from the scriptures. You're going to have to work for a living now. So apparently something changed. Now, God gave a lot of commands to these people in the garden before the flood. He told them to eat all vegetables and plants. We'll see that later on. Genesis 1:30, 29 and 30. All the animals were vegetarian. They were supposed to be. But uh, that doesn't mean everything was obeying God. I mean, the reason we had that flood is because they were disobedient. So the fact that God told them to do something a certain way does not mean that they were. I mean, I hope they were, but apparently somebody wasn't because God had to come down and destroy the whole world. But before the flood came, under this canopy that the earth had, we talked about that in the last uh, class, the uh, canopy of water is probably the best theory, though it's not provable, probably the best theory to explain why things were so different before the flood. Rhinoceros was found in Nebraska, a hornless rhinoceros, 18 feet tall. We figure this ceiling in here is 12 feet tall. Six feet higher than the ceiling. That's a big rhinoceros. It was 30 feet long. This room is 32 feet wide. That's a just that's a big rhino, okay? Now, the textbooks will tell the kids this is a prehistoric animal. Now, this is interesting. The word prehistoric was just invented in the last hundred years or so. I got some old dictionaries to look up the word prehistoric. Somebody sent me one from 1766. Dictionary of the English language. When I went to look up prehistoric, it wasn't there. So if you had seen somebody during the time of the revolution here in America and said, what do you think about the prehistoric times? Well, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. There's no such thing. Because in their mind, history starts at the creation. And the world is 6,000 years old. That's what they believed. Um, in 1860, during the Civil War, if you had asked Robert E. Lee, what do you think about prehistoric times? There was no such word. The word did not exist. Darwin's book came out in 1859. Now, there were people before 1859 who believed the earth was millions of years old. But the majority of the population believed the Bible was right. The earth is about 6,000 years old. Because that's what the dates add up to if you figure it out. You know, that's what it says. I haven't been able to find the exact year the word prehistoric was added. If you want to do that, send it to me. Let me know. Somebody sent me a 1928 dictionary. In, it is in there. And that's the earliest one we can find it in. And the last one I've seen that we can't find it in is 1860. So somewhere during that time frame, I would guess around 1900, the word prehistoric was added to the dictionary. Now, there really is no such thing as prehistoric. There is no such thing. 
See, the Bible says, in the beginning. Well, how do you go before that? There are things that are pre-flood, but that is not prehistoric. So don't fall for that. I think before the flood, if there was a canopy of overhead, it would increase air pressure. Now, increased air pressure changes the size of insects you can have. This dragonfly fossil was found that has a three-foot wingspan. That's a big dragonfly. How'd you like to run into that thing at about 70 miles an hour? <laughs> you take the bug deflector and the hood right off and come on through the windshield and join you in the front seat. They just were huge. Now, insects breathe through their skin through what's called spiracles. They don't have lungs and nostrils like we do. They have to absorb oxygen through their skin, which means the larger an insect gets, the more volume it has to its body compared to its surface area. We'll go explain that just a little bit. All right, let's talk about uh, what happens as any object becomes larger. This is something, uh, I, I don't know what the technical name for it is, but it's the surface area to volume ratio, and it changes. I'll show you how this works. Let's take a cube that is one inch on all sides, one inch by one inch by one inch. So the side is one. The volume is one cubic inch. How many square inches of surface are required to make a cube like that? Six. You have six square inches, like a dice has six sides on it. So you have six square inches of surface area. So my volume, my ratio of my surface area compared to the volume is six to one. You follow me? This one cubic inch of material has six square inches to absorb things through. If it was an insect, it has six square inches of skin through which it can absorb oxygen to supply one cubic inch of body. Let's change it to two. Two inches by two inches by two inches. Our side is now two. What is our volume? Eight, two times two times two is eight. What is our surface area? Each side is four, and there are six sides, so it's 24, right? What is our surface area to volume ratio? 24 to 8, which reduces to 3 to 1. So by doubling the size, we now effectively only have half as much skin that you can absorb oxygen through. Anybody follow me on that? They have uh, eight times more body, but only three times more skin. So they are losing out. If they have to absorb something through the skin to supply all that internal tissue, they, don't, they simply don't have enough skin anymore. As it gets larger, the problem gets worse. As you get smaller, the problem becomes much better for an animal that has to absorb through the skin. The other thing that happens, if, if something is depending on friction with the wind, like an, uh, an ant falling out of a tree, if an ant falls out of the tree, he's got his own parachute built in because he's got so much surface area and so little volume. He's mostly surface area, so he's got lots of friction with the wind, so he falls, shh, hits the ground, and walks off. <laughs> Doesn't hurt him. You can drop ants out of an airplane. They can fall 10 miles, and, well, airplanes don't go 10 miles, but they hit the ground and, and, and walk off. It doesn't phase them because they, they fall so slowly. Whereas the bigger a person is, the less surface area to volume ratio they have, and so you just simply don't get enough friction with the wind, and you and I can't fall out of an airplane and survive unless we're really lucky. There have been people who fall out without a parachute and survive, but I wouldn't want to try it personally. Now, since an insect has to absorb through its skin oxygen, the bigger it gets, the more this becomes a problem. So there's a maximum size insects can get based upon how much air pressure there is. But if you increase the air pressure, now they don't need quite as much skin because they're getting, say, twice as much oxygen through every square inch of skin, so they can survive just fine. That explains why we find some absolutely gigantic insects. Cockroaches today get, you know, two inches long as a big cockroach. We have them all over Florida here, right? But yet 18-inch cockroaches have been found in the fossil record. How'd you like to find those under the kitchen cabinet, you know? 
Can you imagine a foot and a half long, a half meter cockroach? A friend of mine, uh, Fred Gayford up in Canada, does uh, video um, and uh, does graphics and artwork and editing and stuff like that. And he, he took together, put this picture together for me. He also speaks on creation. He sends me a lot of pictures that he does like this. That's his wife about to swap that 18 inch long cockroach. I'm glad they don't get that big. I mean, they're bad enough around here. Up north in Illinois, where I'm from, you know, cockroaches are, you know, three quarters of an inch long, no big deal, you know. But down here, well, you're in the fruit, fruit business, you know about the cockroaches we've got. Um, in Germany, they found an eight and a half foot long centipede fossil. Can you imagine? That's a big centipede. There's Fred, you know, going to shoot it with his shotgun. But uh, that's a giant centipede. Now, when you consider the surface area to volume ratio problem they would have, one of those, thankfully, could not survive today. I believe there are some 12 inch centipedes today in the world. Maybe some bigger than that, I don't know, in some of the jungles and things like that. But even 12 inches is a big centipede. But eight and a half feet is lots bigger. I suspect these, ki these type insects could not survive today. And this is one of the evidences that something was different before the flood came. I think the pre-flood world had to have more air pressure, precisely because of the surface area to volume problem. All right. There are some good creationists who do not agree with the canopy theory. I spent quite a bit of time talking to Walt Brown, who's a great guy, has a tremendous book in the beginning. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona. I met me at the airport when I was there a few months ago, and we had dinner or lunch together. He does not think there was a canopy. He thinks there are some problems with the theory. Uh, I listened to his problems. I've listened to them before from other people, and I think there's a solution to it. Uh, and I asked him, well, what about the giant insects? How do you explain that? He said, well, we don't have an answer to that one. That's why I think this is really a, a powerful evidence that there must have been something to increase air pressure before the flood came. And the canopy so far is the best available theory for what that might have been. Grasshoppers have been found that are two feet long. These are fossils of grasshoppers. When you consider, they not only have to get oxygen to their skin to survive, they have to fly. Now, flight takes an enormous amount of energy and a lot more oxygen than just walking does. So they'd have to have something very different about the grasshoppers. Cattail fossils have been found that are 60 feet tall. You figure, you know, a six-story building. That's a big cattail. Just what's called, they call it a cone. The, the brown part on the cattail is called the cone. Just the cone is 10 feet long. It's high as these pillars. That's the cone on these cattails that are found fossilized. Uh, a donkey was found in Lubbock, Texas that was nine feet high at the shoulder. Again, the pillar's 10 feet tall for comparison, so figure nine feet to the shoulder of the donkey. Um, buffalo horns have been found that have a 12-foot horn span. That would be a big buffalo. The core to this buffalo horn, with, see, cows and buffalo have the bony part in the middle, and then they have the horn sheath on the outside. The horn is actually longer than the bony part inside. Um, it's called the core, the horn core. And Carl Baugh has the horn core up in his museum. If you're ever going across Texas, you can stop and see Carl Baugh's museum in Glen Rose, where this horn core is. The, the horn core is eight feet. So the buffalo had 12-foot horn. I tell folks, you show me a home where that buffalo roams, and I'll show you a wreck. <laughs> that would have been a disaster. Beaver fossils are found, indicating they got eight feet long. I was preaching up at uh, Maranatha Baptist Bible College in Wisconsin, and I stopped in um, Johnson Creek, Wisconsin, just north of the Illinois border, and I met Jim Erb. There's his phone number. Jim was uh, working on his farm, digging something with a tractor, and found this beaver jaw fossilized. They dug around, did not find anything. They didn't find the rest of the beaver. All they found was the lower jaw. They dug around for a while. Some university uh, professors came out there and dug for a while, couldn't find the rest of it. But there's other indications around the world that beavers were absolutely huge. This beaver would have been about eight feet long. And, you know, if, if the world before the flood was vastly different with much larger trees, you would need much larger beavers to chew them down. Everything was kept balanced back in those days also, just like God takes care of everything. Increasing air pressure 
also increases the amount of oxygen that diffuses into the water. Our little fish pond out here, we have a fountain that's bubbling to try to add oxygen to the water because fish have to breathe underwater. You know, they suck the water through their gills and the gills absorb the oxygen and get into their bloodstream. Well, eventually, pond water can become stagnant and the fish will all die because they've used up all the oxygen in there. But if you increase air pressure, more oxygen goes into the water, which means if the world had greater air pressure, it would not only increase the size of the insects and increase the size of the trees, it would increase the size of the fish and the number of fish that can survive per cubic mile of ocean water because now there's more oxygen available, which means everything, everything changes, okay? Lots more things grow in the water and lots more fish eat those things and so there's, no, there's less competition for food so you get a larger population that can survive in a given area. Today, you know, farmers out in uh, South Dakota, for instance, you have to have about 10 acres to raise one cow. Whereas you get down here in Florida, you only have to have, say, one acre to raise two cows. You know, half acre is, supplies enough grass for a cow. I don't know what the ratio is, but that's the idea. You have just more food available. What if you had a pre-flood world that had greater air pressure, greater carbon dioxide, you get much more plants growing, many more plants growing per acre. Now the animal population can skyrocket and it's not a problem. There's no competition for food, which means there wouldn't have to be any carnivorous animals. As long as there's plenty of food, the animals don't fight. If there's plenty of food around, no reason to be upset about it, you know. It's only when things get tight, you know, that they start to argue and bicker and fight over things. A shark's jaw, like this one, uh, you can tell roughly the size of the shark by how big the teeth are. And it's different for different species of sharks, and there's probably 80 or 100 different species of sharks or varieties of sharks, but generally the rule is a one-inch tooth means the shark was 12 to 15 feet long. When I was in Hawaii, we went over to the big island to see the volcano. You were with us, Marlissa, weren't you on that one? And uh, we bought this shark's jaw, and the guy said it came from about a 15-foot shark. Now, sharks have all cartilage. They don't have any bones in their body except for the teeth, when it's not really bone, but that's the hard part. So the rest of the, you know, shark's teeth are about the only thing you ever find preserved. The rest of them rots because it's just cartilage. They don't have a bony structure. Um, so they, this one is dried out. I've got it in the office down there, the shark's jaw. But about uh, 12 to 15 feet for one inch of tooth. Now, fossil shark's teeth are found, indicating sharks got to be 80 feet long before the flood. Can you imagine an 80-foot shark? Um, you could walk right into the jaw easily, standing up. One fellow said, do you believe Jonah was swallowed by a whale? Oh, yeah. Well, actually, the Bible says great fish, but could have been a whale. I don't know. I'm not sure if whales in God's uh, classification system uh, are, but it appears that whales are classified as fish. Anything lives in the water is a fish. Just because we decided to classify whales and dolphins as mammals, and, you know, by our classification system they are, that doesn't mean the Bible system is wrong. They just had a different system of a way of classifying things. But Jonah was swallowed by something that was awful big. The Bible says God prepared this creature to swallow Jonah. God had prepared a great fish, so it may have been something special about it. I don't know. But, you know, this one's big enough to swallow a Volkswagen, certainly big enough to swallow a man. If you get uh, J. Vernon McGee's book, uh, Commentary on Jonah, you're J. Vernon McGee, the guy on the radio, you know, this is J. Vernon McGee, you know, God bless you, my beloved. You know, he's been long dead now, but he's, if you get his book on Jonah and read the, there, this commentary, he goes through several instances where uh, people or animals have been swallowed and lived, swallowed by a whale and lived. Was that story on the radio this morning about that? Yeah. Some guy named Bartlett uh, washed overboard on a ship and was swallowed and found two days later alive, bleached out. His skin never did recover. The rest of his life he looked pretty weird, you know, as the way I understand it. It happened in 1890-something or something, a whaling ship. But he, he tells that story on there. Um, so sharks were bigger. Turtles, uh, evidence is found that turtles were huge before the flood. This one is in Peabody Museum, uh, which is in Yale University in Connecticut showing a turtle about 12 feet, maybe 13 or 14 feet. I don't know how long the tail was. That would be a large turtle. Birds, 
fossils. Now, bird fossils, uh, birds don't fossilize easily because their bones are hollow. Because bird bones are hollow, which gives them really more strength and less weight. If you notice bridges, the structure of bridges is often full of holes. It relieves some of the weight and adds more surface area. It goes into another physical problem of if you take a piece of solid pipe and bend it, if you drilled a hole all the way through the middle of the pipe, a hollow pipe would be harder to bend because it has more surface area. Less mass, but more surface area, and actually is harder to bend. So oftentimes, hollow is stronger. Any engineer that builds bridges will tell you, yeah, that's right, you know, hollow can be stronger. And bird bones are hollow, which means they're less likely to fossilize. They're more likely to just crumble, you know, get smashed or something like that. But in spite of that obvious difficulty, bird fossils have been found, indicating they got about 13 feet tall. Now, there were some birds that were on the islands of uh, New Zealand and maybe Australia, uh, even 800 years ago, that the Maori people over there, the Maori Indians, were killing them and eating them. And these birds were 8 or 10 feet tall. Giant birds were alive on Earth just, you know, eight or 900 years ago, and they were killing them on these islands. Apparently, they've all gone extinct now. Um, though there are some people arguing that they're not extinct on some of the Pacific Islands. Well, you know, who knows? That's, they find some eggs of these things that are enormous. These huge eggs have been found over the last 100 years. Somebody thinks, you know, they're still alive. I don't know. That gets into the cryptozoology study of giant birds. You can read it for yourself and see what you think. Reptiles, lizards, never stop growing. Reptiles grow all their life. Now, people stop growing. What happens, the ends of your bones in your body have a certain type of cell that keeps multiplying and reproducing, and when you reach a certain size, that stops. If you break your arm or your leg at the joint when you're a child, if you break across those special cells that continue to grow, there's a possibility your arm or leg will be actually shorter than it should be because you broke it during childhood while it's in the growth stage. You can break your arm in other places and it won't affect the length of it, but if you break it across those special cells that are continually growing, you know, you may end up with a short arm or something for the rest of your life. Okay, who cares? Anyway, reptiles never stop growing. They grow all their life. When uh, we went to um, Orlando, I was with Eric, I know. Marissa, were you with on that trip? We went to Alligator Farm? Okay. We stopped at the Alligator Farm where they raise alligators for, you know, for e they eat them and, you know, make stuff out of their skin and stuff like that. I talked to the manager. He took me and showed me all the stuff around there and got me into the back sides and saw, not, not part of the normal tour. I made friends with him and I said, sir, can you tell me how big do these things get? How, how fast do they grow? He said, well, we raise them here under what we consider as close to ideal conditions as we can. You know, plenty of food, perfect climate, you know, we watch for diseases and we keep all the ones the same age together. So there's no bully in the bunch. They're all the same age, growing together, so there's less fighting that way. Uh, whereas if you have one 14-foot alligator with a bunch of 3-foot alligators, you know, they don't have much of a chance of survival. So we keep them separated by their age group. He said, under these pretty close to ideal conditions, we can get an alligator from an egg in one year to 5 feet long. He said the second year, they get up to 7 feet long. So 0 to 5 feet and then five feet to seven feet. He said, then the growth rate continues to slow down, but they never stop growing. They may grow a foot the next year and eight inches the next year and six inches the next year, and, but they just, they just simply never stop growing. Now, how big they get, of course, depends on numerous factors. Genetics, you know, what species is it, what type of alligator, um, food supply, disease, things like that. But regardless of all those things, the simple fact is they never stop growing. So if you put lizards in the pre-flood world and let them live to be 900 years old, it is, it is known, for instance, that most reptiles live about as long as, reptiles can live as long as humans. The Galapagos turtles, have you seen those giant tortoises you see at the circus or at the uh, uh, zoos once in a while? They've got these huge turtles. They, they, they know they live over 200 years. They suspect they might live 400 years, you know, but who's around to watch it, you know, for 400 years? Um, if reptiles lived even longer than humans, then, of course, the problem becomes worse. But even if they only live to be 900 years, a reptile that never stops growing for 900 years is going to get to be a big lizard after a while. Dinosaurs were probably just giant reptiles 
that lived before the flood. They did not live millions of years ago. They're just big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve. Even today, reptiles never stop growing. When we first moved in here uh, 11 years ago, um, I went around and met all the neighbors. Jan, do you remember the folks down the street that had the uh, um, pet shop? They raised pets to sell. Just where they tore the, it's in a trailer down there. They've tore it down now. It's where the PCC print shop is. But I went down, knocked on the door, and the guy said, come on in. So I walked in. As soon as I stepped in the kitchen, right in front of me was a five-foot-long iguana. Just standing there looking at me. I held real still. I said, does he bite? The guy said, no, we just fed it. I said, man, how big is it going to get? He said, oh, they never stop growing. He said, I raise them right here and sell them to pet stores. I said, what's the biggest one you've ever seen? He said, oh, I've seen them 10 feet long. Iguanas. I went down six months later, knocked on the door. Hey, how's the iguana doing? He said, oh, we don't know. I said, you don't know? He said, no, he got out. I said, you mean like outside? He said, yeah, he's around here in the neighborhood someplace. If you see it, give me a call, would you? <laughs> I said, forget it, man. I'm calling 911 if I see a six-foot iguana crawling around the neighborhood. He never did find it. Now, he told me, he said, it probably won't survive because it's been hand-fed all of its life. You know, it doesn't know how to hunt for food. Plus, some dog or herd of cats or something is going to, you know, worry this thing to death. And he said, it's probably too big now to climb trees. Plus, it's certainly too out of shape to climb trees because we've been raising it in the kitchen all this time. But they, they just never stop growing. So I think before the flood, they got to be huge. You can buy these today, a Jackson Chameleon. You can buy these at the pet store. They have three horns on their face. Now, something like that at 15 tons would probably be resemble what we have as the Triceratops. Man and dinosaurs lived at the same time. The Bible says God made everything in six days, so he made dinosaurs at the same time. Human and dinosaur bones have been found together, proving they live together. Human and dinosaurs are found together on artwork. In Peru, they find the humans and dinosaurs together on what are called the Ica stones. Dr. Ball has a couple of the stones. Don Patton has some in Texas, I have both friends of mine. Uh, Dr. Dakara in uh, in south of Lima, Peru, collects these stones. He has a museum of them. He has 11,000 of them in his museum. About 50,000 have been found. They're called the Ica stones. Now, let me tell you the story about the Ica stones and uh, show you what the, the propaganda, the, what the opponents are going to say about this. These stones were apparently first really discovered by the Spanish conquistadors back in 1570 when they came through this area. They found these stones with strange animals. Now, the Spanish didn't know what they were. Turns out there's dinosaurs carved on these rocks. And the Spanish found them, you know, over 400 years ago and reported them, but didn't know what they were. But let's finish up on these Ica stones here. Um, <clears throat> when they were first discovered, the Spanish didn't know what they were. They just said, well, we found some strange animals carved on rocks. We've never seen these animals before. So they didn't, you know, know what to say about them. Then, in 1961, people began finding more of these things and collecting them. This is just kind of a local phenomenon in Peru. Now, you have to understand, Peru has a lot of ancient history. The Inca, Inca, not Ica, Inca Indians, and some of these other Indian tribes down there, you know, have a lot of pottery and stuff. And if you're caught selling what's called the Peruvian national treasure without a permit, in other words, you've got to pay the government, you know, so they get their cut out of it, you go to jail. A Peruvian jail sentence is the equivalent to an American death sentence. You go to jail, you last about two years down there. Just horrible conditions. So, one farmer who's been finding these stones on his property and selling them to Dr. Dakara, for instance, or other people, you know, souvenir hunters. Wow, look at this rock with dinosaurs and humans on there. He's been selling these things. He's finding them. He doesn't tell people where he finds them because, of course, they're going to go steal them, you know, out of this grave. But uh, he was put on TV in front of the camera, and they were interviewing him, some media thing was, saying, you know, tell us about these stones you have with dinosaurs and humans on there. Right behind the camera were two Peruvian police officers waiting for him to say, I'm finding them and selling them, so they could arrest him. So instead, the farmer stood on camera and said, oh, I make these stones and sell them. It's a hobby of mine. So they said, would you please make some for us right here? 
And so he carved one, and it was a horrible, like a child's picture compared to real artwork, you know. And nothing at all similar to these stones he's, you know, selling. Also, they analyzed these stones and found out they have an oxidized coating. Uh, most materials, over time, they oxidize. They react to the oxygen in the air, and they develop a coating on it. Your car does the same thing, you know. The paint starts to lose its uh, shine as it gets an oxidized coating, and use rubbing compound to get that off and shine it back up. Well, these stones have an oxidized coating that would take a minimum of 200 years to develop that much oxidation. So nobody's making these in the last 200 years. Now, why would anybody make 50,000 stones? Don't they have something else to do with their time than sit around and carve dinosaurs and humans together? The other interesting thing about these stones, we'll get into more of that later, is the dinosaurs that are on there have circles on the side. Nobody has ever seen dinosaur skin because when you find a dinosaur in the ground you find the bones okay the rest is rotted away so nobody knew for sure what dinosaur skin looked like until 1992 or 3 I believe somebody in Bolivia found fossilized dinosaur skin and guess what there were rosetta patterns circles the scales were arranged in like nodules on the side they actually had circles on them nobody there's no way they could have known that when they made these stones, because the skin was just discovered in the last 10 years. Carl Baugh has the piece of dinosaur skin in his museum in Texas, the one that was found. I met the missionary, I met the wife of the missionary, or the best friend of the missionary or something, who found it down in, I believe it was Bolivia or Peru, Bolivia, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, we'll get into more of that later. Okay, so that's about the dinosaurs and humans living together. Next class, we'll talk about uh, dinosaur and human footprints. I've read all the controversy for and against this, and we're going to explain the whole thing about the truth, what I consider to be the truth about the dinosaur and human footprints in our next class. Thank you for joining us.